for the most part, people don't understand drones. So when they do, they're comfortable with it. When they don't, they want to see it burn. <laughs> And then when you go out and see it in real life, it's like, well, that's freaking cool as crap. You remember that scene in Star Wars with the speeder bikes? Everybody watched that scene and you wanted to be on the speeder bikes. Flying FPV, that's the closest analogy to what that's like. So you might have seen drone footage before, but you probably haven't seen drone footage like this. So if you're prone to motion sickness, you might want to grab a barf bag because it's about to get wild. Since you're little, you dream of flying. And you, you know all the superheroes like you know um, Superman and Iron Man. Basically, that's that's the feeling FPV gives you. Who hasn't looked up at the sky and thought, "Man, I wish I could be Superman and just go 100 miles an hour with a cinema camera." So you're basically flying a little Lamborghini. It is all manual. When we fly these things, every movement that you see is input or not input from the pilot. It was like freedom, you know, it was like total freedom, separation of body and mind. Apart from flying a wingsuit, FV is as close as real flying as it can get. You'll get shaky, your hands are shaking, your heart is pounding. This is an adrenaline rush. Get ready for like the ride of your life. Whether it's diving down the side of a mountain, skimming along the top of the water, at, you know, 100 miles an hour. There's no other feeling like it. There's no other way to get that rush that you get when you're flying FPV. So flying FPV, you're always looking for like this dope spot to fly. If you've ever skated, most people are like, oh, they're looking at stair sets and handrails rather than, you know, maybe an architecture of a building. Where with FPV, we look at these things so differently now because you can fly in three-dimensional space. With FPV technology, it's just up to your skills how crazy and good the shot gets. Having that headroom on the power lets you do a lot of the crazy stuff that we're able to pull off. Pulling out at a gap at the very bottom of a building dive to go underneath this tree. The adrenaline is always there, no matter how long you've been flying. You feel the power, you feel the speed. The sensation that you get or the adrenaline rush comes from directly comes from speed. Even now, I get shaky hands, I get uh, almost dizzy about it. A lot of times you don't notice in the goggles. It's only when you come back and you're like, oh, my hands are shaking, why are my hands shaking? Because you just dove, you know, 100 feet through a tiny little gap with your drone that you really like. The first time I saw FPV, I thought to myself, I'm never playing another video game again. Your environments are mountains, rivers, lakes, marshes, beaches, whatever you want your environment to be. It is the closest thing that you can get to flying a fighter jet without actually flying a fighter jet. 
You don't strap into the jet, you strap the jet onto you. When you put on the goggles, you are completely immersed and you don't feel like you're sitting there flying a drone, you feel like you're actually flying. The adrenaline that goes through your veins is extremely similar to actually flying a fighter jet. This is something that you could only do with these highly specialized quadcopters. And you land and you, you take the goggles off and there you are in the park and you're like, what? I it feels like my life and a million dollars is on the line. Hi, I'm James Christensen and I'm a documentarian. I'm also an FPV drone pilot since 2018 and I have been watching many of the influencers and top drone pilots. These are very skilled pilots around the world, uh, most of them posting on YouTube or Instagram, which we'll see mostly Instagram handles for all of the pilots represented in this film. I have come out from LA to within a short drive of Atlanta, Georgia, Knoxville, through Florida, New York, and also interviewed pilots from other countries as well. 2020 is going to be a pivotal year for the history of drones. And when I say drones, I mean quadcopters. And it's not limited to toy drones or larger professional drones, camera drones, FPV drones, delivery drones. Drones in general are going to have a very pivotal year in what is decided with the regulations coming from the FAA. We have the protest coming up at the end of the month, February 2020, in Washington, D.C. It's at the FAA building, and these pilots will come out and they're going to protest the fact that they need to be able to save their hobby, and for many of them, it's a profession as well. So, come on this journey with me into the amazing, fascinating adrenaline rush of FPV culture worldwide. FPV, first person view. First person view is you are not looking at the aircraft from the outside, you are inside the aircraft, virtually, looking out. Back in 2008, I started putting cameras on um, just remote control airplanes, no FPV yet, um, and basically just trying to do some HD footage of, of my surrounding neighborhood. Uh, just out of out of my backyard, I could launch a plane and fly in the most beautiful scenery. Back in the day, there were no drones. Um, it was only model aircraft. Um, you had to buy cameras from like um, baby uh, baby monitors, like hack the equipment out of it, and then just tape it onto um, not even purpose-built airplanes, just airplanes that you would buy in an old uh, rusty model shop. And Basically, we used old ski goggles and then we uh, cut out the front and taped in some old personal video goggles. And so we hacked up a receiver and like taped that to our face. Uh, we bought Wi-Fi range extender antennas to, to get more range out of our equipment. So this was kind of the early days of hacking together equipment that really wasn't made for FPV. We had to make them back in the days because there was just no um, purpose-built FPV equipment. So that's what we designed and then started to sell and then it turned into a business. I started flying RC helicopters uh, with the age of 12 or 13. So I'm in this RC hobby for a very long time, for over 28 years. All of us started with airplanes and helicopters and then moved to drones. And that's where a lot of experience comes from. I actually started out with RC planes, fixed-wing planes, before I got into multi-rotors and mini-quads. That was some of the first aircraft that I built were fixed-wing planes. So really what inspired me to get into FPV was a uh, Team Black Sheep video, which was trappy flying. Uh, and they were flying wings and diving down the sides of mountains with them, and that kind of really set it off for me. 
I've always wanted to skydive and fly, so this was just something where I didn't have to put my body in harm's way. FPV actually started for me with Chappie. He was actually a huge inspiration with his TBS Discovery. Uh, it wasn't until I went on the forums that I learned like, okay, how do you put one of these together? Like, oh shoot, I got to pick up a soldering iron, but I didn't care. I was like, I want to figure this out. Figured out MacGyver style. Like you were just on the internet forums for hours on end looking for answers. And so people would just buy stuff and just plug it in and cross your fingers that the magic smoke wouldn't come out because you just never knew. In the beginning, it was really janky. People were using these wee nunchucks and pulling the, the gyros and accelerometers out of that and putting them into these multi-rotors in order to be the sensors to get these things to fly. So it was very like hacked together and we slowly started to get more things that were built specifically for the purpose um, of flying FPV. The, the very first FPV drones had uh, scavenged uh, surveillance cameras in them. Bare bones, like basic literal security cameras. Most people are familiar with drones that they see in Best Buy, like DJI Phantoms or Mavics. I think a camera drone is best thought of as a, like a tripod in the sky. It's gonna have larger props, it's gonna have a gimbal, so the camera can tilt while the drone is sort of hovering in place. A freestyle or racing drone, its goal is to give the pilot the experience of flight. It's got a fixed angle, and that means that the camera on it is actually up tilted a little bit, so the pilot can be looking ahead while the quad pitches forward. It was kind of a byproduct of being super lightweight to just mount or strap a GoPro to your quad, but it's also something that was intentionally done to um, provide the flying experience to the viewer. And so every tilt Every piece of movement that you see, that's what the drone is doing. And that's what makes FPV so unique, is that the flying is more inherently the subject of the video. For the most part, people that fly FPV are used to very crappy video signals and just the ter most terrible image you could ever expect someone to be able to fly an aircraft with. This signal is super weak, it's super scratchy, they're static all the time. So many people think that what we see in the goggles is like what a GoPro shows you. Because that's what we show you guys when we upload this stuff to YouTube. But now we got these new systems, these new digital systems, which are high definition. So 2015 Joe Nationals was, I think, in my opinion, and I, I think I speak for a lot of people here, it was probably one of the best FPV events ever. Probably because A, it was the first time where people from like all around the world came together. And it was really the first time, you know, people were starting to put, you know, names to faces because up until now, our entire relationship within the community just existed on forums and messages. So not long after the, the Drone Nationals, Dubai comes out with the World Drone Pre of 2016. And that was an absolute huge deal. A, because first of all, y'all gotta go to Dubai and you know Dubai is big, grand and large. And I remember showing up and they showed like the racetrack lit up at night. So not only did it look crazy beautiful, but the freaking track like articulated, like it breathed and moved. But to kick her, a million dollar purse, never heard of before. And I feel like that just straight like legitimized drone racing. And then the, the, the kid I tried to, to strangle with my arm is Luke Bannister, known as uh, Bani UK, who won the Dubai World Drone Prix big race. And as you can see in the photo, this is the hat Mr. Steele gave me uh, to avoid the sunburst on my almost bald head. And 
then the freestyle scene kind of emerged with uh, Charpu to basically make it um, artistic. I would watch YouTube all the time and I found Sharpu uh, flying around these trees and these abandoned spots and I thought that was, it was just mind blowing the very first time I ever saw that. Sharpu is uh, very, very creative. He actually was an animator at DreamWorks and so I think a lot of that carried over. He just would come up with some of the most wild ideas for videos. A lot of people who are in FPV think of some of the early like Sharpu videos. Um, the early Rotor Riot episodes. He's a taxi driver from Mexico City. That's where we got him. We picked him up. He's now a professional quad pilot. You know, there's gonna be a point where people are gonna be shooting down drones because they're everywhere, right? So that's kind of like a way of like testing it, seeing it, you know, seeing if we can actually shoot down one of these little drones that we generally fly. The odds are very slim. You want to put bets on I it? I think it'll be a lucky Anybody? shot. Anybody? Yeah. Lucky shot. It's going to be really hard, but I kind of want it to happen. If you want to know about nearly anything, you just go search it on YouTube. At least that's what I do. And I think a lot of people, maybe they discover the hobby by watching FPV pilots on YouTube. Someone shares a clip with them. I would say like 2014 is really when it started, and then it's kind of exponentially grown since then. Um, but yeah, putting security systems and remotely flying aircraft via goggles is just something that's been around for a while. We've just refined it a lot in the last six years. Being able to fly is such an amazing experience. And my goal is to help everybody who wants that amazing transcendent experience be able to get through the obstacle course and be able to enjoy the hobby. People send me things occasionally. This is a sign that a local guy made for me with my slogan on it. That's kind of cool. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. So my brand is FPV Know-It-All. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, at least that's the intent. Uh, I don't literally know everything. Bardwell answers everybody. That guy never stops. Like, when we're shooting together, he's just in the back seat on the way to the spot, just non-stop on the phone, answering every question that, like, the patience of that man. A lot of my content is for beginners because much of my content is driven by the questions that I get. I let my email inbox every morning write my editorial calendar for me. If I start getting a question five, six, seven times, I just like, I gotta make a video about it. The antennas that come with the goggles have this shoulder here to prevent you from twisting off the internal SMA connector. It kind of cinches it down. So I have a degree in computer science from Georgia Tech. So I've got this background in computers and familiarity with computers and maybe even a little bit of programming. When I was a kid, my dad was into electronics. He taught me to solder. So I've got this background with, with electronics. Another piece of my background that I think really makes a difference is that I spent about 10 years as an instructor and a courseware designer doing classroom instruction. Not like academic, but like corporate. I spent a lot of time figuring out how to break complex topics down into an understandable way and then communicate them to people uh, in a way that the people could, could get. I think that's what I'm most proud of, is the people out there who say, I wouldn't be in the air if it weren't for Bardwell's videos. I got into FPV fairly quickly, mainly just because of my background with electronics engineering and being around my father as a DIY, self-employed electronics engineer at home. This workshop behind me is where I put together all the drones and whatever projects I'm working on. Hey guys, so this is my drone wall. This is where I keep all of my older drones that I don't really fly anymore. It's just kind of a decorative way to store these things. You know, I built this thing for a race in Dubai and ended up like kind of making it into some long range drone where I don't necessarily always fly far away, but this thing will fly for like 12 minutes opposed to my normal three to five. So this is like my very first drone ever. This is a mini quad made by a company called Blackout. This particular quad got run over by a trophy truck on my very first commercial gig ever. And this thing fail safed, which means it lost RC connection, fell out of the sky onto the racetrack and got run over. So, so this drone right here is like the combination of six years of R&D and testing and trial and error. Every time I go out, this is exactly 
Every video I've ever made has been flown with something either similar to this or this exact unit itself. So like anything, skateboarding, working on cars, you gotta have the right tool for the right job. And so this is a typical two millimeter driver that we would use to work on drones. In the last few years, technology has become a little bit more accessible. And obviously these drones are becoming easier and easier to build. Uh, so that's drawing in more and more people. The FPV community mainly takes place on the internet. We're spread across the globe, and most interactions with each other are all done on Facebook groups. FPV is basically this one giant tribe from all around the world. When I go live on any social media platform, there are people from all over the world that will comment in, uh, whether or not they're from Asia, Europe, South America, it doesn't matter. So there's a lot of very interesting interactions that you have when you have like this broad worldwide social media reach for a very niche market. But also because in a lot of places there just aren't any other FPV pilots, you could be like the only one in your small town and you just kind of got to do it yourself. Social media has enabled us to find each other and congregate in these bigger groups. Like I have thousands of people that I interact with online on social media. So when you get a chance to go to an event and meet other pilots in person, I think it's really special, it's really important. It kind of gets the keyboard out of the way and gets you face to face. The FPV community in general is just so helpful. You know, it's a place where everyone just contributes ideas and goes to find inspiration. I learn myself from the community. You know, I go back and learn and try to find, find new things that I hadn't known about see what other people are working on. It's this place where everyone learns, and I think that that's just so amazing to have. We created the TBS Lounge, which is like a lounge for FPV pilots to hang out and just talk about whatever they want, except politics, <laughs> and uh, it has to be FPV related. So it has come be kind of the center of the FPV community, and everybody who, who does anything that they want to boast about or share or help other people, at least one funny meme a day in the, in the TBS lounge. But it's always related to something FPV, right? So. We kind of joke that when you become a pilot, the first thing you do is make a logo, pick a pilot name, then you build your drone and learn to fly. What is it with pilots and their brands? I don't know the answer to this question. As soon as they get into the hobby, they want to hire somebody to make them a logo, but I cannot explain it to you. I guess it probably has something to do with social media culture. That's how you rep your brand. That's how you like give your buddies a sticker, you know? Like the sticker just indicates like, I know this guy or you met this person in person. If he becomes your identity, so why would you not, you know, want to buy the URL, get some stickers made of your name, let everybody know what your pilot name is. It's a way to reinvent yourself. Everybody has stickers. Everybody has stickers. Please stop sending me stickers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Surfers are really protective of their spots because like there's only so many waves, right? If there's a really good spot and somebody else gets your wave, you're not going to get it. And it feels like FPV pilots are a little bit like that too. Um, or they could piss off the security guards or get the cops called on you. Maybe you're not quite supposed to be there. But if you're cool about it, then you won't get in any trouble. We've had police ride up on us and not know what we're doing alone in a parking lot and making all this noise. We have thought, well, these kind of police officers want to go for a quick ride. <laughs> but you put the goggles on them, you take them for a ride, they think it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And we get away with getting to stay at a lot of spots that way. The only other thing that, like, how I recognize FPV drone pilots is massive backpacks at airports. <laughs> so, like, you can pick out a, a drone pilot from a thousand people easily because they have a backpack full of stuff and they always get checked at security. The king of carrying extras is definitely Corey. Like, today his bag was, like, 50 pounds and mine was maybe 20. You never fly your last pack. So the minute you say, this is my last pack, then I'm going home, you're gonna lose your quad. It's gonna explode. Some people keep a charged pack, and that is their quote unquote last pack, and they just leave it. I'm not making this up. 
they superstitiously just leave their last pack in their backpack. But the quad gods know that's not really your last pack. They, you can't fool them that simply. A lot of people who used to skateboard and now they're like, they're middle-aged and they're tired of breaking their bones, end up as FPV pilots because it's like the same kind of thrill and challenge to do a new trick. So with skateboarding, you typically show up to a spot and then you kind of explore it and find out what you can use and what you can't use, maybe a handrail, skate stair sets or ledges. With FPV, you really do the same thing. So you show up and you're like, wow, there's a gap there, there's this hole here, there may be some, you know, some kind of weird thing that I can slide on. <laughs> for cool spots, but instead of handrails, you're looking for dive gaps. If you have a flat parking lot, there's probably nothing interesting to skate there. Once you have elevation changes and you have stairs, there's something cool to skate there. Same thing applies with FPV. It really does feel like skateboarding in the air. My friends that don't fly ask me what it's like, I say it's like skateboarding in the air. And I also have a, a large background or a long history of skateboarding, which I think also carried over. And it makes sense that a lot of pilots come from these worlds. That was, that was like the, the new normal was to break things. With flying FPV, I can chase that same itch. I can try to push myself without risking more titanium rods in my body. You're like, okay, here we go. Oh no, I crashed. Oh no, I screwed it up. And pack after pack after pack after pack after pack until sometimes you break through. I thrash my drones. I don't give a shit what my drones look like. I don't care. As long as they fly, I'm throwing it through that gap. You know, it's gonna slam into a wall and still take off. If the props are bent, whatever, it'll just keep flying. If I were still skating, I would be injured all the time. Um, so yeah. You can either break your legs or your wrists, or you can just break your pocketbook and fly FPV. Somewhere out there, there's somebody who's like, that's the whole point, brah, is that it's, there's something on the line. But you reach a point in your life where you're tired of going to the hospital with broken bones and sprains, and, and you're just like, I'm done with that. So you get everything together for a nice day out with your friends, plug in, you get your tones, be -dee -dee. put your goggles on, no video. No. This is why FPV is like such a pain in the ass sometimes. Or then you left something at home. And then you left something at home, that's the main one. Or you didn't charge a GoPro. Or you didn't yeah. charge a GoPro. Or you didn't charge your radio. Or you that's didn't charge your radio. So what's the solution, tell us. Just bring four or five quads. <laughs> you never have to worry about four or five quads, three or four GoPros. I don't go as hard as Corey does, no. so I don't do as much damage to my equipment as Corey does. How about that? I remember my first time breaking something. I was like, oh my God, I broke a prop. And people were like, oh, that's nothing. If you spend your whole time being terrified that you're going to crash, then you'll never get better. That's really the only way that you're going to really learn and excel as a pilot. Like, you just got to be willing to break something. And let's face it, that's kind of like half the fun, right? You egg each other on, you're like, hey, I I bet you can't hit that. Ooh. There's a branch up there. Trees grab you. Trees will pull you right out of the air. Trees will gobble you up and not let you fall to the ground. And heaven forbid you get into a palm tree because that's like the end all. That's it. You get on top of a palm tree and you're done. First pack with my freestyle quad. I'm a racer. Check this out. Where skateboarding sometimes takes, you know, 100 tries and you can fall down and hurt yourself really bad and that's gonna affect your next line. FPV is just a drone. Get a new drone, fix the motor, whatever it is, and you can continue to hit that crazy gap or do that crazy line until you do it. The 
movement can just seem really random, but it's actually very practiced. We actually have a, a whole set of defined tricks. You gotta start with the split S. Everybody's first trick is a split S. You know, some of the most common ones would be like a power loop where you go under something and power and essentially loop around and come back under it. Every trick in FPV really boils down to a combination of three basic moves. The roll, the pitch, which is a flip, or yaw. And the first time you go to a place, there's like this magic to it because you don't know where all the lines are. You don't know everywhere that you can flow. So it's a little bit exploratory. It might be your second pack, or it might be your 20th pack. You just don't know. But there's always that one pack that you know you're gonna get the best clips from. There's that one. So like, and I feel like that FPV is definitely a transition from BMX or any type of skateboarding, BMX, snowboarding, because that uh, thing of flow, three. like just the flow of cruising down a mountain or hitting that grind that you want it is pretty much identical to hitting the gap or hitting this band though that you wanted to fly. I mean, you just don't have to get hurt. <laughs> it's beautiful. Carbon. Carbon so that we can basically just like break the... I may never make it into Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but I did make it into a drone simulator, and I'd, I'll count that as a win. Good morning. We are now in Orlando, Florida, where we are going to visit today with Rotor Riot. I uh, just got off the phone with Drew. We're going to go meet up at the warehouse and we're gonna find a bando, which is um, an abandoned lot or abandoned structure of some kind. We're in Orlando, Florida at the Rotorat headquarters where we've got our offices, our studio, and our warehouse. Rotorat was founded by Chad Capper. It's like his second RC YouTube venture after flight test. It was founded with the idea of being at the center of FPV culture, and it really evolved to be at the center of FPV freestyle culture specifically. The idea was get top pilots and personalities, put them together on a show. I'm Joshua Bardwell. I'm Alex Vanover. I'm Sean Morrison. And I'm Ladrib. And have them challenge each other, go on adventures, and take the audience along with them. The episodes we make are supposed to be educational, teach you a little bit about how to do the, this whole FPV thing, and more importantly, it's supposed to be inspirational. We're really lucky to have a team that, in their own way, wants to inspire people to fly and help them get into this hobby. Be sure to like, subscribe. We'll catch you on the next one. So this would be like our go-to build. It's the HD1 and uh, it's based on the original CL1 frame. We modified it to uh, accommodate the DJI system just by making it a little bit longer. It's probably our cheapest frame, but it's still very durable with like five millimeter arms. It can take a pretty, a pretty good beating. This is something new we're doing. It's the DigiWhoop. So it's kind of reminiscent of the Tiny Whoops. So it's a little bit bigger. It's, I think it's a two inch prop rather than I think true Tiny Whoops are like one inch props, but it's actually digital, right? So it's using the Cadex Vista. So it's compatible with the DJI system. So to be able to fly something this small, where you can really fly it. I mean, this is more than enough space. You could fly this around your house and have digital HD. It's pretty fun. What is a bando? A bando is an abandoned building.
abandoned buildings, that, that's another thing where FUU really became popular because people were exploring uh, abandoned buildings and factories, flying into windows, exploring old you know, facilities. <laughs> Vandals are golden just because of the layout. There's so many, the way it looks on film, the way it feels to fly, the structures of it, there's holes everywhere, there's cool things. Number one, you have structures. Number two, you typically don't have windows or glass in the windows. So all of those openings are openings that you can fly through. Elevator shafts, windows, there's so many different variations of what you can do in a bando. So today we are doing a rotor riot shoot kind of on location. Um, there's some local pilots that I saw flying this really cool looking bando and I reached out to them. Um, actually one of them is my buddy Edwin, aka Erod Yo. And when I started flying, I lived in Detroit and I lived there for the first you know, three years of me flying. And we have bandos everywhere. You know, there's little areas in Detroit where you've got five world-class spots all within 10 minutes of each other. I mean, some of them you could literally fly the other spot while you're standing at one spot. Bandos are usually always gonna be concrete, metal, rusty, gritty. When you crash, it's pretty brutal. I do love flying tree spots too. It's a great place to train, but when you get to a bando, that's like, that's the best FPV experience, I think. This Whoa. is amazing. Wow. This is so amazing. Are Whoa. you kidding me, dog? Just flying in, in open space is boring. So you're looking for obstacles and a bando is like, it's the holy grail of obstacles because you can crash into anything. Nobody's gonna complain. There's not gonna be any people there. So it's perfectly safe. It's just the ultimate playground uh, for, for FPV pilots. Freestyle is about pushing the limits of the drone, being fast and agile, but also creating a beautiful shot. The subject of that shot is the movement of the drone itself. It's highlighting the, the drone capability and the piloting skill in an artful way. Well, now I'm rolling out of it sideways, so you gotta think on your feet and turn that to the next thing and just keep the line going. holes and walls that are blown out that you can fly through. You've got uh, shafts you can dive down, all sorts of ways that you can push yourself and what the drone is doing and with a really high risk factor because this is all concrete, this is metal. When you crash, it's not like you're crashing in the branches of a tree. It's a nice little cushion for you to go in. You're probably gonna break something. Yeah, Bando's a great dynamic spot for FPV because you get all of these different diverse types of elements. I mean, you can fly inside the actual buildings themselves where you're just trying to not hit anything, or you can fly on the outsides of the buildings and kind of dive along the side or do these wall rides along the side. Inside the building itself, I saw these two this pair of cylinders, and so I was trying to do a big power loop around those, and I finally ended up getting it, which is awesome. We're out there and we're watching each other fly, and all we want to do is see the other people improve and push the other people to the best of their abilities, and there's nothing more fun than that. We really push each other. When we watch each other fly, especially in person, you see them pull off something, like, okay, I gotta do, no, I gotta one-up that. I've gotta take that trick and make it even better.
sometimes you will smack right into a metal beam, but these drones are pretty tough. And a lot of the times you'll be able to bend the props back and fly again. And if you're really good, sometimes you'll be able to recover and fly away from the crash. For the past five years, I've been as engaged as I can be to help the FAA develop reasonable and appropriate policy. Uh, I was on the registration task force in 2015, then two other aviation rulemaking committees for flight over people, as well as remote identification. And I've been on the drone advisory committee for the past several years, as long as it's existed. The ARC provided an 80 page report to the FAA, which set out different ways to accomplish remote ID, but didn't recommend any single way to do it. And so you know, what you had is, is these stakeholders agreeing that, look, th at the end of the day, this remote ID requirement has to be reasonable, has to be low cost, low burden, has to respect privacy. And then you have the FAA two years later actually not listening to that part of the advice. I think what the FAA came out with is a proposal that is overly burdensome and, and overreaching. They want every aircraft over 250 grams, 0.55 pounds, in the national airspace of the United States to continuously report its location and other information about itself back to a central database. It's an all of the above approach in which you have to provide remote ID information in more than one way uh, and in ways that are extremely costly. It would be very easy and very um, low impact to come up with a solution that's based on the RF we already use, but instead they're coming up with these very odd ideas about essentially building an iPhone into your drone. This hobby is really expensive. We put a lot of time, money, and energy into it, so I can't imagine paying a cell phone subscription for each of my drones. So as far as a small business, um, a modular remote ID unit would be absolutely critical because we don't, you know, the FPV market is kind of small and, and when you innovate, you're not going to sell a whole lot of units right off the bat. So something modular that you can put into a custom build, you know, very simply is, is going to be critical as far as allowing innovation to happen. So people building their own drones can add the remote ID component to it and comply with the rule. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're going to have a remote ID solution ultimately that fails and doesn't satisfy the government's needs. Individual hobbyists, innovators, STEM programs, small companies, all are just going to not be able to exist. If this is not possible to build your custom drone or to innovate and maybe tinker a bit and change something here and there, you would basically take away those shots and the possibility of doing things in the future that we maybe even cannot think of today. At DJI, we don't just advocate for what's good for us. We really are advocating for what's good for the entire drone community. So one of the things we did is we proactively developed a remote ID solution called Drone to Phone that shows the FAA and other regulators that a broadcast solution works. It works in an urban environment and it would be free because it would involve software changes to many drones and a phone app that people could download and use for free. And you would not need any of that network infrastructure, the service providers that are expected to charge monthly fees, the network connectivity, which comes with its own costs and complexities. Products that are sold will have to comply. And then at some point, products that you have that can't do remote ID would have to stop being used. The worst thing is I've got 15 to 20 drones that are going to be pretty much worthless if that doesn't get um, changed and um, and the, and a lot of people are in the same boat I'm in. These proposed regulations are trying to blanket kill an entire industry when in reality what we're doing is just for fun. We're not trying to spy on people or deliver packages. We just want we, we want the ground. We want like 20 feet. That's about it. You know, most freestyle racing drones. We're not going super high in the air. If we had to go to fly in just little areas and just little parks, I mean, it would just take away all the creativity and just uh, what makes FPV what it actually is, like the real core of it. Who wants to be stuck at the same designated park with probably zero features along with the 50,000 other people that are all trying to do the same thing? It's kind of sad because we think what we're doing is pretty safe and it's pretty awesome. It's a really interesting and multifaceted hobby that kind of gets pushed into in, into an illegal space. 
Where FPV fits into the current rule that's proposed and the industry that's trying to be created by companies like Amazon and Google is that, in my opinion, it really doesn't. And that's pretty much exactly what the rule tells us. There is no place for you here. You will not fly. It's just shooting ourselves in the foot. Other countries are gonna take off and run with this technology and American innovation is gonna die. Uh, the entire drone industry grew out of hobbyists. There has to be a way to, to balance both sides where you can keep things safe, but still have the freedom to, to fly anywhere. Definitely worth saving, it's worth protecting and defending. At this point in 2020, there was just kind of a period of being in the dark. You know, the FAA is not usually receiving more than, say, 5,000 comments in a comment period. They received 53,000 comments from the community. Not only to mention that an actual protest happened at the FAA building, and nothing like this had ever happened before. But key individuals like Brennan Schulman and, say, David Messina from the FPV Freedom Coalition they really helped effectively advocate for the FPV drone community as well as really just any recreational drone flyer. And me, speaking back into 2020, at this point, the pilots and the community really thought at large there was, there was no way this was going to change. Are we going to lose our hobby as we know it? This is something I believe is going to be very significant, no matter what the outcome is of the uh, NPRM, this uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, I've got to capture it. We've got to capture what happens here in 2020. I bought a plane ticket. I'm packing up my camera and my gear, and I'm going to fly to Washington, D.C., meet up with some of these influencers that I've met with, and capture this day of protest, because this is history in the making. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how is this going to make an impact if people don't really know what FPV drones are and this amazing community? My expectations for today, um, I think it's mostly important that there just is a presence here. I think that the actual communication with the FAA is going to happen in more sort of private meetings and committees. I mean, I think one of the biggest problems is that they don't really even know we exist. Um, I know that the organizers have a bunch of stuff planned. There's going to be picketing. I'm mostly just looking forward to uh, seeing who comes and uh, showing the people in our community that we are going to be out here fighting for them. Is, is Rotary going to riot here? No, we are not. This is not a place. This is a place to peacefully protest and to have our voices heard. I'm a little nervous that it's not going to be a huge turnout um, because uh, we're so spread out and it's it's it feels like we have such a large community, but it's just like it's like this thin membrane spread across the world. If it was ever going to matter, if it was ever going to be worth taking time off work and getting on a plane and doing something expensive and obtrusive and inconvenient. It's kind of, kind of now if you actually care about this stuff. There's a lot of power in coming together physically, uh, especially for a community that is so spread out and does most of its communication and interaction electronically. Regardless of how you do it, why you do it, what you're doing it for, we all love this weird hobby. And it's under threat, and we got to do something about it. The FAA released its notice of proposed rulemaking, that's called NPRM, um, just after Christmas in 2019, um, which then started a 60-day comment period. The protest was held in February on the last day to submit comments, kind of as a way to raise awareness with all the live streams and everything that happened, all the pictures posted to Instagram and social media. Uh, Enoch FPV had taken the initiative 
to plan a day of protest. People from all over the country coming here to save their access to hobby flight. And together this community has now really created a bunch of momentum. And this momentum is gonna move forward in a way that I don't think the FAA was expecting. was just a really profound statement that I don't think a lot of people in the FAA had truly grasped until we showed up on their door. We do need things like remote ID and registration, but we need to do it in a way that is reasonable and fair to the community and to the technology. It's very understandable why this community would come out and protest on a cold day with picket signs in front of the FAA. Uh, because I, I, I think they read a proposal that doesn't take into account their concerns uh, and is not realistic for the kinds of technology they use. It was a great turnout. I mean, it was a far bigger turnout than I had imagined. It was a really cold day. I, I marched, um, I held signs, and I chanted. Mostly I think what I did was I got to connect with other people who were there. We did our chants, we marched. And we did actually like get people coming up to us on the street asking what this is about. We actually got uh, news articles written about the movement. It's one piece of fighting for this hobby. And we'll go back to Washington as many times as it takes to make sure that the world actually knows that first off we exist and that what we do is worth saving. We had about 250 people out there, all um, taking time out of their day, and ages ranging out there from 10 years old to 80 years old. We had kids there that were brought by their moms. There was a whole group of FPV moms with their 13-year-old kids that were into this hobby. Because it's the youth who were also a part of this. Let's keep the STEM going. So I've been into FEV for about four years and it's stuck with me more than anything else I've done before. Um, and it's allowed me to learn just so much more than I've, I would have ever expected when I started. When I heard the FAA was trying to take away drones, I went to my first protest ever. We went down there, people assembled. People are very passionate about FPV and it was so awesome to see everybody it's important for influencers to show up to not only show that they care, but also to meet the people that they've influenced. And for me personally, I met a dude that, he, he's from Alaska, and he drove here based on a video that I made a week ago. It was cool to be able to go up there and show my support and hang out with people that are also supportive of you know, stopping extra drone regulation that is unnecessary. I see the need for regulation to make sure people have to stay safe, but over-regulation is going to stifle any amount of innovation. We can stand and do everything that we need to do as a united body. At minimum, give us a way to throw a module on our drone so that we can comply. It may not end today. This may just be the beginning. There's gonna be a lot of steps after this. It's not, we're not gonna win just from having a protest in a park. But the protest in the park is giving us all more power. We're gonna protect our access to the sky, and we're gonna do it together as one community. Basically, when I got started in FPV, I just had really got to flying with the goggles on. And um, approximately a month after that, my daughter passed away. And so in, in the midst of all that agony and um, pain I was going through, basically I could go to the park after work and um, fly my drones and I could get away from all that I was feeling, you know, and was bothering me um, inside for three minutes at a time. I got to get up in the air and fly and um, on occasion, you know, I actually even felt closer to my daughter, but that, that laid the um, foundation for me in FPV and why I feel like I should give back so much. Hey, come this way. My local community, 
needed somebody like me to help out and I stepped up and now we have great races and, and it's still a part of my life two and a half years later. Nice. Pilots, are you ready? Let me see your thumbs. One, two, three. Pilots are ready. Pilots, on your quads. On the tone, less than five. So one of the things that makes Multi-GP so instrumental in the hobby is that it is near you. There are so many chapters around the world, uh, both local chapters, and then those local chapters will branch into a regional chapter. So for instance, we're filming here in South Carolina, and not 20 minutes away, there's a Multi-GP chapter here in Greenville that's very active, races regularly, and so it's very important that if someone's looking to pick up FPV here in Greenville, for example, they can go out there and see what FPV actually is. I am not a racer. I cannot compete on that level. Uh, the I've tried. <laughs> it's just different skill sets and a different discipline. Because racing, the level's so high today. You need to do that and that only if you want to be at the top. That time by lasting a 24.375, which breaks the previous record. I'm 17 years old now, and I started flying remote control airplanes with my dad at the age of six. I started getting into RC airplanes, flying them competitively at around the age of 10. Uh, my name's Evan Turner. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. Right on. What's your position right now? Uh, either first or second, I'm not sure. So cool to go from flying these remote control airplanes third person to being able to sit inside of one. That's really what drew me into it. Multi-GP is very grassroots. Everyone's building their own drones. You can do whatever you'd like to these drones to make it fly to the best of your ability and preferences. So I was able to go to a local chapter, meet with a group of guys that were already sanctioned through Multi-GP and get my racing journey started. There's just so much to FPV nowadays and it's gotten a lot better, but having someone there that's local and can help you out through the building and purchasing process is super beneficial. It's the most fun racing for anyone and everyone, whether it's your first race or your 100th race, that is Multi-GP's goal, is to grow the sport of drone racing and to make it as fun as possible for each and every one. So for the world's best racers, in my opinion, the Multi-GP National Championship is the pinnacle of the sport. They take FPV truly uh, to a worldwide scale. If you go on to Multi-GP, you will find a chapter in your area and you will find pilots that you can fly with, whether you want to race or not. With the Multi-GP Drone Racing League, over 20,000 pilots from across the world use our platform for organizing and making drone racing most efficient. Right behind me on this awesome uh, track here at Daytona Stadium in beautiful Daytona, Florida. We're battling it out for a DRL contract, over $10,000 in cash prizes and bragging rights. For the last two years, we've been one of the primary sponsors of the Multi-GB National Championship. At Multi-GP events, you can just be in the stands as a spectator with your own goggles on your face and watching the pilots feed live. Coming from my competitive background, I really just had a drive to want to not be the second best, not be the third best, but to be the best. I saw and I got to meet all these guys and see the community behind it and see how bad everyone else wanted it. And I knew that I had the drive and the will to want it more, if not the same amount as them. So I worked very, very hard, and I came back in 2018 and actually was able to win my first Multi-GP National Championship. We're pretty famous for being the main sponsor at uh, Multi-GP I.O. every year. It's in Muncie, Indiana in August, and it's pretty much the biggest celebration of FPV. There's 400, 500 pilots there every year, and we all just get together and have a great time. You would think it would be specifically for racing, but because you have people traveling 
to go to this race and they're from all over the world, you get this kind of like mixing, melting pot of people that show up that don't even race and they're just like coming over because they know there are going to be a lot of top name pilots there. It's kind of transformed from just a race in the last few years to like almost this Tomorrowland-esque style event that happens for FPV. Like they have these tiny whoop things where they light up hoops and fly through them and it's a, it's a fun environment to be in. Take it easy, take it easy. Hold on, there you go, okay, let's go. Let's go. Initially, there was a whole situation where if you plugged in on somebody else's channel and that caused someone to crash, then like the marshals would come. If anybody powers up his quad above the allowed power level or during another person's race, he was gonna hammer and smash the quad. That was like the rumor and nobody had that happened yet, it was all bluff. And then all of a sudden, someone turned in on a freestyle uh, flight line and it caused someone in a race to crash. And all these people came over from the race and they were all upset. And the founder of MultiGP at the time, Chris Thomas was over there with the hammer. And then I was like, you won't do it. And eventually, yeah, he got hammered. They literally just put the quad on this table and hammered it. And then I made a video about it and it became Hammergate. He ended up um, replacing it because he felt bad for the kid. Th that event is now known as Hammergate. Plugging in on somebody is the worst thing you can do. That's the biggest social faux pas, not to mention just being rude. If somebody's flying in the air, you want to find out what channel they're on. If you're on a close channel and you plug in, you're going to block out their view. Of, you know, they're going to get all static or they're going to see your drone on the ground. Do not plug in on people. Don't be that person. You go out there and you're flying, somebody powers up. And you're like, who, who powered up? Who powered up? But you gotta have a sense of humor about it because you're gonna do it to somebody else too, probably, eventually. Lately I've been more focused on the cinematic side of FPV and a lot of the designs are just motivated by a certain shot that someone might, might wanna get. And, uh, the design is all driven by the needs of the, the pilots. One of the designs that really got popular f of mine um, was the Squirt, which is a, a tiny little ducted drone that I originally designed for Robert McIntosh. So it's a little three-inch ducted uh, drone for carrying a GoPro Hero. It's a little bit slower, a little more focused on the subject instead of on, on, the, on the piloting skills. I mean, especially Andy, he, he created the squirt. That was, you know, technology that enabled uh, people to do shots that were not possible before. And that created a whole new style of shooting uh, drone videos. It's just giving people a totally new perspective of our world. Flying a Cinewoop is very different from flying any other rig. They bring a level of safety to this, which is pretty nice because now you can fly around people and just the general reaction that we get from people is, is really positive. And then suddenly you have a machine that can fly and be touched by people and go through people. And that's what I really like about it. You can have this whole interaction of movement and uh, then it becomes like kind of like a dance between you and the drone and that person. And you feel like you're actually with the person performing with them. So I did this video with Lotfi Lamali, who is a professional longboarder. And we just went and did this awesome video, had a lot of fun. He did the single greatest uh, cinema video ever still, the long border. And he kept like catching it, throwing it, like going under the skateboard. You know, it was such a perfect video in that he had a great location, had a great subject, great music, great editing. And yeah, it opened up like this whole genre of flying that's now like part of I mean, it's almost 50% of what people fly, I'd say. And now it's kind of spawned a whole movement and a million clones of uh, the original design. 
FPV is not just one thing, it's a whole spectrum. And it's really both for me. Freestyle and cinematic go hand in hand. Um, you have to have the technicality, but you have to have the eye as well. I have a lot of respect for those people that basically night and day think about how can we do things differently and how can we push innovation to create even cooler shots. Tommy, uh, you my god, um, who came up with this, you know, little conversion of the Cinewoops where you basically decays a, a GoPro and then put it on top and that became, that became a standard now, you know? More often than not, you know, I have a director asking me like, oh, can you get like this close to the guy's face? I want to make out his eyelash and, you know, fly through this tiny little gap. And today we're at a point where we are literally just taking apart a GoPro down to its bare minimum so that it can fit onto a small little form factor like this. I mean, look at this guy. You can pretty much fly this through anything. The third one I have is called the Thick. It's a uh, seven inch X8, which is an octocopter. So instead of four motors, it has eight. So it can lift uh, a bigger camera, like a Blackmagic Pocket or a Red Komodo. The center of mass of the drone is as centered as possible. And it's, it's quite timely that all these manufacturers are coming out with kind of smaller uh, form factor cameras that are worthy of feature films, you know? I've been on shoots with uh, Gab and Nurk, and they're like, they're almost like a computer programmed robotic arm. They can fly the same line again and again and again. So for a director, it's almost like having this instant camera that can go anywhere. Because you know, you never know what the director is start throwing at you. It is definitely skill based, 100%. Uh, snowboarding, uh, wakeboarding. I see a lot of wakeboarding content. It's just pretty uh, wild, some of the stuff that's out there now. Like snowboarding is cool, you know, um, mountain biking is a perfect example. Wingsuit pilots base jumpers, paragliders, all these kind of things that previously you couldn't really film very safely are now possible because of FPV and because of mini quads. With FPV, you, you can get real close to someone and you can move in a similar way to that person. Mixing, drifting, and FPV is kind of the best of what we've got right now in two different hobbies and art forms. These two together, like the two troublemakers together, just makes sense in the end, I think. Hey, next, roll A. So we are constantly hearing what the director says, and sometimes when we're lucky, we get to be on the big screen over there. This is also, by the way, live. Uh, and hundreds of thousands of people are watching it across the world. So you better not mess it up because if you do, everyone's going to see it. Live is completely, it's a, it's a completely different animal. But yeah, I love it because you get to work with new technologies and try things out. This 
thing that we did, no one really did it before in that form. And we made those FPV drones uh, just so that they can fly uh, with that technology on. I think we're all like adrenaline junkies in our hobby because we're just looking for it. With, drifting, with cars drifting at 100 miles an hour and us flying about a meter away from them. Especially when you see some of the shots that can be done of drift cars, you quickly realize there's no other way to get a shot like this. Drifting and FPV just is like the perfect match. Drifting cars are not that super fast. They always have the same speed. It looks spectacular because you have smokes and tires, you know, bursting. And it goes really well with each other just because the way a car drifts around a corner is very similar to how a drone flies on a bank turn. It is very much like a dance when you pair the two together. Drifting, you know, it's kind of like an art. You're out there, you know, the drivers are doing the thing, trying to hit those lines smooth, trying to get that time. And the, the drone above it is also just trying to keep its line above the drift car, trying to get those smooth lines. And they just complement each other so well. Drifting is very much an art form. Also, it's got this like technological, motorsports-y kind of modification culture around it. And that's like the same exact thing as FPV. people in the FPV community view Atlanta as the Mecca. They want to go there, they want to fly these spots. Just having the diversity of like a growing, expanding city, all the foliage, and then the, the melting pot of people and culture that lives here, it just ultimately became like this amazing FPV Mecca. Early on in FPV, so many great FPV pilots seemed to come out of Atlanta. And they formed this community together that was just this amazing birthing ground for great FPV skill. Um, I think they all made themselves better as a result of all these great pilots being together in the same community. They're like a really special breed of people. Like they have very short attention span, but they are like neurotically focused on details at, uh, in other areas, right? So, so like the communication is, it's like herding cats, but um, once they're on site and, and everything is ready to go, like they make magic happen. When you have a community to inspire you, to challenge you, to show you things that you would never have thought were possible, you become better. Everyone becomes better as a result.
Atlanta specifically in 2016, it was all about me, Steel, Schizo, and Wild Willie. Uh, Willard, Nick Willard. We always had this really ambitious, like wanting to push things all the time and, we're, and not necessarily trying to stay ahead of the curve. It was just something that came natural to us. Meeting up with Kevin and John and a couple people. I hear quads. Let's see what's going down. And we would always just push each other. I would, you know, be flying around a spot, trying to find lines, and then I would watch Kevin. I would tap into his feet and be like, oh, I didn't know we could do that. The progression in that little group in that little area is just intense. Like you go there, you come back feeling like you really accomplished something huge. Every pilot down there is really killing it. Oh, God, that guy's <laughs> back. Guess who else moved to Atlanta? <laughs> Dude, have you ever heard of this guy? I don't know. It's just a big melting pot of very extreme and uh, talented people. So I just want, I'm just looking forward to getting together with a bunch of great pilots and a bunch of friends and just flying for a day. Kevin is like, just has this innate, like magical, like skill to find dope spots to fly at. It was just really easy to go there and just on the daily find a new spot that was really cool to rip at. There's so many good spots in Atlanta. I don't know if it's just because I lived in Atlanta for a while. Because of the schools that are there, you know, Georgia Tech being one, there's a lot of uh, technically minded people that adopted FPV early on. And so you have all of these amazing office parks that we're able to fly. It has more trees per square mile than any other metropolis in the US. This is an amazing spot. Office parks like this are so much fun. There's so much cool architecture to interact with. There will be carnage, there will be. I mean, mine won't be too broken because I'm running the Bachrinder AFX frame, which is the strongest frame on the market right now. But there will be some carnage for sure. When we get together, it's like, you know, hey, what have you been working on? Or what's that, what's changed on your drone? Because it's always like an ever-changing process. There's new technology, there's new equipment. There might be new motors, new props, all of this stuff. Like equates to how the drone flies and honestly it's just fun to interact and kind of share the knowledge of what you've done and what see what other people have done vista naked vista <gasps> oh that's hot <laughs> but uh what's your controller still, still the x90. x90 baby you all send the lad up and again you watch him <laughs> how many times i reside in greenville south carolina at the moment um I'm a part-time MPV pilot. I work a lot. Um, whenever I get the chance, I go out and fly empty parking lots. I love it. Probably gonna do it to the day I die. All right, I'm ready to rip. Let's go fly.
Um, frequency management was a lot easier with less people. Um, the bigger it gets, the more confusing it gets, the more tempers start to come out because people plug in and that causes someone to crash. Can I power up now on race eight? Yes. I'm gonna walk over here, get away from y'all. You can only have two, four guys up in the air at a time. So I don't wanna go to a flying spot and have 40 people there. I wanna have like half a dozen. You have to like find this middle ground of making it a social event, but not too big of a social event so that you can actually get some flying time in. Who's on race eight? I'm on race eight. Because at that point, once there gets to be too much people, like you can't go as far or you can't, you know, because then you have video issues. All right, going up on eight. Why are we all on race eight? Basically, instead of swapping the whole motor, you can just put the, this piece, chunk, screw it in, we're done. Ah! What was that? I just was doing some little. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go between the pillars, around the thing, turn left, and weave it in, and then up through the gap and over the dome, then down into the gap, and then weave out and miss everything, and it's gonna be awesome. So sorry. So. Oh, damn, son, two in a row. So we're trying to you know, hit all of these certain clipping points and then also be able to do it in a smooth fashion. Um, but once he did it, then you know, I'm falling right behind him and then you, know, you got to take it to the next level and that is him chasing me or me chasing him, getting that like double footage, the third person style footage. <laughs> Cycle, good as new. Mostly. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take like the, the B, the B plus. It ain't the A plus, but it's the B. I'll take a B minus. I was like, well, I can't be smoother than schizo. I can't be more technical than steel. So all I can do is like go bigger. So I'm gonna do shit that people think is impossible and make it possible. And that's kind of what I did. trying to chase each other, because it's always fun trying to follow quads. Especially with analog, because you literally can't see anything. Kevin!
everybody started doing their own thing and moved away. So it was really nice to come together again and see everybody vibing off each other and trying to one up each other and flying and everything. It really did feel like like those trips used to be back in the day. I told Stingy that, you know, I was like, man, this feels like back in the day. Being able to go out and fly with your friends is like going to a soccer game or, you know, doing something that allows you to hang out with people that are like minded. And I really enjoy being with them. And I hope that, you know, regulation doesn't take away from that. It's possible that this could be one of the last times when this many people come together in one place and fly. If remote ID goes through, a lot of people are gonna drop out. I mean, the, the, the trippiest thing for me when I started was to take off and circle myself and see myself fly. It actually does provide this kind of spiritual experience. I mean, you literally are having an out-of-body experience. I think one of the, the first times you really bug out when you're flying is the first time you are flying and you see yourself, you're like, oh, that's me, and I'm not in my body, it's... You see like a, a GT, GTA version of yourself with a remote controller. And, and then see myself standing there while I was clearly in this little machine for me, in my head. So it was like, it was literally an out-of-body experience the first time. It, it's 100% out-of-body experience. So I say all the time, like, when I'm flying, I'm like, oh, drone me did this, because that's what it is. At that point, when you're flying and the goggles on, you're two separate beings. You're human you that's controlling things and you're drone you that's flying around. I think what we're all looking for is that state of flow. You, you are essentially one with the craft. You're not fighting it, you're not, you're not trying to overthink what you're doing. And everything is just natural. We're there resonating with the environment. To really make very smooth movements, you have to kind of anticipate where your drone is going to be in the next 10 seconds. And you have to um, make the movement transition into that state. To just have that state of flow where you never appear to hesitate and it always feels like you know where you're going next. Just everything feels like it's going right. You feel completely connected to the quad. All the tricks are leading into each other and flowing between each other perfectly. And you just get this amazing sense of, of bliss and accomplishment. But I get like this kind of release of endorphins by getting into the flow state and being able to control a drone in a way that I just don't even realize is happening. I can't describe it other than being in a state of flow and it's an addictive state to be in. There's never, there's never a ceiling. You've never figured out every trick, figured out every flow, mastered every possible line. If you think you have, you're just not being creative enough. You, you can't get this experience any other way. It's beyond the, the capabilities of the human body. Everything is like making noise at you. And then you put on your goggles and for three to five minutes, 
it's absolute silence and you're just focused on that screen right in front of you. When you get to the point of entering that flow state, it's ultimate happiness. You're not worried about anything else. There's nothing in the world, there's no stress. There's no anxiety, there's no depression, there's no hate, there's none of that. It's just you and the quad. When, when you're in that, you're, you're no longer thinking about anything other than the movement that, that's happening. Everything else turns off, except for the one or two things in your brain that you need to fly. I'd almost even say that it becomes effortless at that point once you get into this crazy nirvana state. When you hit that, man, it's like there's nothing else like it. We just go out of our bodies and suddenly you're limitless. Before you go, if you're interested in watching the entire Flow State film from start to finish with no ads and in much better image quality than YouTube gives you, not all 1080p's are made equal. Some 1080p's are higher bitrate and better image quality than others. If you want all that, there's two options. Number one, you can buy the film on Vimeo. There's a link in the video description below to where you can pick that up. Or if you're one of those people who still collects and watches physical media, I know you're out there. We sell it on Blu-ray. And again, there's a link in the video description below as well. On the other hand, if you want to keep watching on YouTube, all the videos are in a playlist, including the outtakes and director's cut stuff, the stuff that didn't make the final edit. Uh, and I'll put cards on screen and links in the video description to those. See you there.